I thank you all for coming on this rainy night. Uh, welcome to the uh, World Art Center SFU Woodward's Building. Um, this is the first of the uh, lecture series on Aboriginal issues. We are we're presenting it with S SFU in con conjunction with uh, UBC. Um, so we are co-hosted by the Indigenous Research Institute and the SFU Woodward's um, Community Enga Office for Community Engagement. And we're also supported by uh, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. And also we're brought to you also in conjunction from the Office for uh, Aboriginal Peoples. My name is uh, Klahani R. Rourke. Uh, I work for the Office for Aboriginal Peoples. Um, tonight we are presenting, oh, and uh, of course with Am Joel, who's sitting there. Um, tonight we are presenting Dr. Eldon Yellowhorn. He is the chair of the First Nations Studies Department He's also the acting chair of the Re in okay, Indigenous Research Institute. He's also a professor of uh, archaeology here at SFU. We, he will be presenting the historical archaeology and the Pikani First Nations um, um, First Nations um, lecture. Um, Dr. Uh, Alvin Yellowhorn. Thank you very much for uh, coming this evening uh, and attending. I'm very uh, pleased tonight uh, as part of this lecture uh, to be premiering the documentary, a local uh, premiere for the documentary that I made about the uh, historical archaeology uh, project at uh, Bikani. Uh, I started this uh, project, it was a SHRC funded uh, research project uh, a few years back. And I remember when I went down to, uh, when I went down to uh, make the pitch to the chief and counsel at Brockett about uh, doing this project, uh, I kind of knew that you know, if I made a, if I was to write a, a standard historiography, uh, probably nobody would ever sign it out of the library or read it, you know. Uh, but I also figured that my best way of presenting this would probably be uh, through videography. Uh, the only problem was that I had no idea how to make uh, video documentaries, you know, so I said I would do it anyway. And uh, so uh, as soon as they agreed to it, I thought to myself, well, I, I guess I better go out and learn how to make video documentaries. <laughs> so I uh, quickly uh, enrolled in a boot camp in uh, uh, filmmaking and uh, went off on that and <clears throat> then over the rest of the time it's, it's been a, a matter of, of learning through uh, being out there you know I, I never realized how much I would enjoy uh, making making films uh, but you know it, to me it was a, kind of a continuation of my interest in photography I'd always been ever since I, uh, I was a teenager I'd always been interested in photography. Uh, so to me, this was just kind of the next step uh, on that. And I also used to work for the National Park Service doing, uh, being an interpreter. And so as part of this, I would have to make these little uh, slideshows about the uh, parks. And uh, so doing this is just replacing the still photos with moving pictures. But it's still about creating a narrative and uh, uh, about engaging the audience in that narrative. Uh, so I, I started doing this research at, at Brockett, and I found it to be very uh, fulfilling. Uh, and then over the course of doing this, you know, I didn't, I didn't get to this point by myself. Uh, some of the people who you'll see on video tonight uh, were formerly my graduate students, such as Simon Solomon, who came down there with me in uh, 2007, I believe, or 2008. And uh, oh, for two summers actually, you came down, and, and also Sandy Dielison and Christina Hannes, uh, who's uh, still here in Vancouver working for the uh, Union of BC Indian Chiefs now. Uh, so the three of them participated in different aspects of the, the research, uh, but the, the overall research program uh, kind of uh, creates this, this narrative. And <clears throat> 
the type of research that I've been doing in the last little while in archaeology uh, falls into what's recently been called uh, participatory action research or community-based archaeology, where the community is an integral part of the uh, research agenda and also uh, has a, a big uh, vested interest in the outcomes. So uh, I wanted to, uh, this, this documentary has come about as well by the uh, participation of not just the grad students, but also uh, talented people from SFU. Uh, for example, uh, Vicki Kelly, who is a professor in the Faculty of Education, uh, did, this, did the music for us. So the, the soundtrack that we have, or the score of this, is original music uh, that was uh, made by, by Vicki Kelly. Uh, also, uh, Robin Weaselbear, who uh, is a film studies student here at SFU. Uh, she's also from the same, coincidentally, from the same reserve I'm from. Uh, so she knew a lot of the people that uh, were involved in this, and uh, also, you know, because she's from Brockett, uh, had a, a real keen interest in uh, portraying it in, in a positive way. Uh, and also, uh, just through the uh, funding sources such as SHRC and also uh, with uh, the, uh, the dean's office in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, uh, they've been very generous uh, in pr providing me with uh, space for this. And Earlier on, I did a, a smaller a trailer of this, which I posted on YouTube. Uh, you can, if you're interested in viewing it, it's about six and a half minutes long. And if you go to the Canadian Archaeological Association's uh, website, they have a YouTube channel, and that's where the uh, little mini trailer is, is posted. Uh, this is uh, the longer documentary, you know, and it, it's kind of an introduction. I, I hope to do more of these. Uh, and in fact, right now I'm involved in uh, another uh, project uh, where I'm doing a documentary about the cognitive geography of uh, Blackfoot people. Uh, and you know, my intention is not you know to to bring people's history to them, uh, but also uh, you know I've also been interested in in uh, doing more work in Blackfoot. You know. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the uh, Small Numbers uh, series. You can see that on YouTube as well. Small Numbers Counts to 100, uh, if you want to see it in Blackfoot or in English. Uh, and then there's uh, some others. So I, I want to do uh, documentaries that are completely in Blackfoot. You know, that's like, if you, you'd have to be a Blackfoot speaker to, to understand it. Uh, but also it's, it's about... Uh, doing some, some act, actions for uh, preserving uh, languages, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I have to say when I, my name is Eldon Yellowhorn, eh? but when I started on this filmmaking, you could have called me Eldon Greenhorn, you know. <laughs> I was so raw at this. <laughs> uh, but I've learned over the, the last little while, you know, and, and how to, uh, how to con compose a, a documentary and to make it, uh, one coherent narrative. So uh, we'll play the we'll play the documentary. I have to say, you know, this is a local. This is the Vancouver premiere of this uh, documentary. Uh, last August, I went down to Brockett to do a uh, premiere in the community, and there was a very. Uh, it, was, it was a hot summer evening, and apparently last summer in, in southern Alberta, those were uh, rare days. Uh, still, about uh, 65 people showed up uh, to see the documentary, and uh, the most enthusiastic, enthusiastic response I got was from one person who said uh, she's forever watching these uh, documentaries on uh, television, but this was the first time that she'd seen her own story uh, being told in this way. Uh, so <clears throat> I hope you enjoy it, you know, and we'll turn down the lights and we'll get started on is my first effort at uh, documentary filmmaking. You know, I, I'm actually very pleased with the, the way it turned out, you know, and as I say, this was a, uh, an effort that came to fruition because uh, a lot of people uh, participated in the project, but also helped me uh, bring the film to uh, 
a conclusion because yeah, learning learning the uh, filmmaking is one part of it, but uh, now uh, you know I can do all the editing in my uh, lab uh, on campus. Uh, but learning the software is uh, a big challenge in itself, so that part of it I'm very pleased that I had uh, people such as Robin uh, Weaselbear to uh, put, the, put the film together. Uh, she really uh, displayed her talents, which is uh, what we saw tonight. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, this, is, I, I, this is not the culmination of my career, let's put it that way. You know, this is, uh, as, a, as a filmmaker, I, I think this is just the first step in, in, on that uh, path, you know, so uh, I will be... Uh, producing more of these, and, uh, you know, I had to, at the same time, uh, keep up with uh, technological changes, so uh, my next effort will be in high definition, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that will, be, uh, that will be coming soon. As I, as I said, I'm involved with uh, <clears throat> George Nicholas, who's um, got this eye pinch uh, intellectual property and cultural heritage uh, project going. Uh, this semester I'm participating in uh, making a documentary on uh, Blackfoot cognitive geography. So uh, what it means is uh, going out into uh, the communities and interviewing uh, people who are knowledgeable about that and then at the same time going out and, and shooting footage uh, at these locations so that uh, when we put it all together uh, in, in our little magic box there in uh, the yeah, education building, uh, and then produce something out of that. Uh, for the most part, you know, like, this is, a, this is for the community, the community of Brockett. Um, as I said, when I, when I first started working on this, uh, you know, it was pretty standard uh, that, you know, you write your reports, and you get them published, and then, uh, you know, you get your, your credits that way. Uh, but also I found it a little bit sterile because, uh, you know, like I live in a fairly rarefied uh, environment, you know, with, uh, with academics. Uh, we speak to other academics. Uh, but in something like this community action, uh, community-based archaeology, uh, what results has to be uh, accessible to the, to the community. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a timely but also in a, in a uh, friendly manner so that toning down the vocabulary and not using the jargon that uh, other archaeologists would understand but and nobody else, you know, avoiding that kind of thing. So uh, giving the community a product that they can, uh, again, uh, enjoy over and over again rather than having to, to wait uh, for some schedule on, on the local television network. You know, being able to give each person or each uh, family or anybody who wants it, you know, a copy of this uh, documentary, um, yeah, it, it kind of disseminates that knowledge uh, in a way that, uh, that people can uh, readily uh, relate to. Because I think that's the case with uh, not just Native people, but pretty much everybody that... Uh, we're so accustomed to interacting through media, such as uh, DVDs, that it's a, it's a platform that we can all recognize and uh, understand. Yeah, so uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer your questions. Well, thank you very much for, for coming out. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to wrap it up. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm just curious, because you must have shot a whole bunch of footage. How did you decide what to include and what to exclude? Because I think that's oh, oh, also it, it, really it, a difficult decision and time-consuming. Yeah, so. yeah, for you spend hours and hours looking at the computer screen and cataloging the images that, that you take. Uh, and so that when you start putting, together, putting them together in a, in a documentary fashion, uh, you know where to uh, bring, bring the clips from or to import them into the, into the program. Yeah, you just like, and you can do it at any point, you know, because, uh, um, for example, the, the soundtrack changed uh, during the course of the production. Uh, but it's now so easy to just take a, one strand of that uh, thing that's going across the screen and pull it out 
and put a new one in there, and it's just like changing light bulbs. <laughs> I mean, it's a little more technical than that, but that's how I imagine it. You know? <laughs> it was a very humanizing way of looking at your your territory and your and your your life, and it seemed, it, was, it seemed like a very personalized um, look into your life. How many family members did you have to? Um, ask to be in this document? Did you ask them and they said no? Or <laughs> Oh, um, the, my family, I had to beat them away from the door to, uh, they wanted to join right away, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, yeah, that's very much the, the basis, you know, uh, this type of research, which is very self-reflexive, uh, it's been called like participatory action research or community-based uh, research, archaeological research. Uh, I, the term I prefer to use is internalist archaeology because this is an archaeology that emanates from the internal dialogue uh, that Native people have about uh, the past. You know, it's not uh, it's not one that you know is foreign to them at all. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? One more. Um, could you speak a bit more about cognitive geography? Cognitive geography? Oh, okay, yeah, cognitive geography. Uh, that is one of my, uh, in my undergraduate degrees, I got a, my degree was in geography, my first degree was in geography, and uh, I always enjoyed uh, cartography, ma making maps. Uh, and then I started to look into uh, how did Blackfoot people understand uh, their world? And so... Uh, I started looking around, you know, all across Alberta, there's these place names, uh, like the, the Hand Hills, the Knee Hills. If you go to uh, Calgary, in fact, the, the Blackfoot word for Calgary is elbow, because there's the elbow river that flows right there. Um, there's Nose Hill, there's a park right so outside of Calgary. And then if you go further south, you know, you get to come to a place called the Belly Buttes, and then if you go further south from there, you eventually get to a place called Heart Butte, you know? So all of these place names are all uh, coming from Blackfoot uh, cognitive geography, because that's how we understand the world is the, kind of in anatomical terms. So the, the Rocky Mountains are the, bla uh, the backbone of the world that kind of continues on like that. Yeah. Eldon, you said that um, your, some of your next projects are going to be in the Blackfoot language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many Blackfoot speakers are there? Uh, well, one of the, one of the reasons uh, I'm doing this is because Blackfoot is what's known as an endangered language. You know, uh, We have only a few thousand speakers uh, left. Uh, in Montana, where there's a large uh, Bikani community down there, uh, the Blackfoot language is practically dead. Uh, and I also, I also have to say, on the reserve I'm from, uh, Blackfoot is not very, in very healthy shape either. It's, it's also uh, endangered, you know, in a, threatened in a very real way. Uh, so that's uh, kind of my uh, attempt, not just to archive the language, but to, you know, uh, I think one of the reasons that our languages are, are becoming uh, endangered yeah, is because we're not, we don't hear them on the radio, we don't hear them on television, so we've convinced ourselves that these are not modern languages. And if you hear Blackfoot spoken on the internet, on YouTube, uh, yeah, it drives home the point that these are modern languages and you can actually uh, interact with the modern world using them, you know. Uh, even though, you know, like Blackfoot uh, is uh, an endangered language, uh, there are still people who live their entire lives in Blackfoot. You know, they, they've never learned English. You know, it still kind of surprises me, too. Sort of like a, like a re-emergence of Blackfoot, then? Uh, well, yeah, we're trying to kind of keep it, uh, keep it um, robust. Yeah. Um, I have kind of a two-part question. So when you showed this within the community, what was the makeup of the audience? Were they mainly elders and adults, or were there children present? The, it was uh, just a cross-section of, uh, of the community, you know, really elderly people, uh, but also just some young folks who, uh, you know, were, had something to do, nothing to do that evening, so they decided to come over. and They were just curious, what's going on here? And, oh, well, come in and find out, you know. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm assuming that it was received well by the community. So did they vo um, voice any interest in having you do more documentaries about the area? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, uh, that's one thing. That there's a lot of enthusiasm uh, for that, you know. And 
I've never encountered anybody who, uh, you know, like when I've gone out to ask people to in, for interviews and that, uh, I've never encountered anybody who's shied away from that. Uh, instead, quite the opposite has been the fact uh, everybody seems to be very uh, eager to participate. You know? Yeah. Which makes a big difference, you know, because, uh, yeah, in, in the community, you know, especially something like this, uh, doing archaeology is it's a tough sell because it's not something that people consider part of their traditional uh, package, you know. Uh, so uh, introducing something new like this, uh, fortunately at, at Bikani, because the head smashed in Buffalo Jump is, is right there, uh, and it employs a lot of people. Uh, the local area, people already have a, a pretty good idea or a pretty good uh, impression of archaeology. Uh, so this kind of, this two kind of, uh, and reinforce that that idea. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No. Hey. Well, thank you, Alvin. That was great. Appreciate it.